right, well, this is, this is a nice segue because we've, we've had the mitra clip for a number of years and we, we, we've been doing uh, TAVR for a number of years also. And the, the, the natural next step is, is uh, the transcatheter mitral valves. So we're, we're gonna get into this a little bit today. Uh, it's, not a, it, it's, it's not something that's widely done but uh, it's it's going to be uh, it's going to be very important uh, as we as we move forward in our valve therapies. So what does TMR stand for? Well, quite simply, it stands for transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And who can get TMVR? Well, the the uh, list is fairly short right now. Uh, we're in in early feasibility <coughs> trials, so basically. It's reserved for extreme risk patients, and you know, in general, these are patients that have been turned down by two surgeons, and that's that's been the uh, the request of CMS that that all our transcatheter valves be examined by two surgeons plus one cardiologist because they want to make sure that these are not surgical patients, because as as Vivek said, we. We have very good surgical results, so whenever we can operate on patients, we should be operating on patients. Uh, in the TAVR arena, we're looking at low-risk patients now, uh, just to see how surgery compares with, uh, with the transcatheter valve. So that may eventually come to pass with, with mitral valve patients. Uh, of course, the patients have to have severe MR. And as far as the approaches available today, we had many uh, approaches that we could uh, implement with transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Uh, with, with TMVR, we have two choices. We have transeptal and we have transapical. And unfortunately, uh, we've had a, a good transapical experience with the TAVR, the, the TAVR, uh, TAVR approaches. So it's, it's given us uh, uh, some insight into that. Now, uh, as far as, uh, you know, where are we with uh, TMVR? Well, there's feasibility trials that are going on, and these are with, with mitral-specific valves. These are valves that could go, uh, theoretically, in any mitral annulus. Uh, could go into a, a mitral annulus that has no calcification. We, there's a trial ongoing uh, with Edwards where we, we can use a TAVR valve in the mitral position, and these are placed either in in MAC, uh, mitral annular calcification, uh, or a valve in valve, or it can be a valve in ring. But it's it's got to have uh, at least some type of rigid fixation device already in there, something that this valve will hold on to, because the TAVR valves rely on on calcium and irregular surfaces to to gain hold and to stay in the position. And as of yet in the uh, United States, we, we don't have a FDA approved device specifically for the mitral valve, uh, you know, a pure mitral valve prosthesis and mitral valve replacement. And, and we, there, there are off-label uses of, of various TAVR devices that, that have been implemented. So what, you know, why is our interest in, in mitral valve disease? Well, you know, if you look here, this, this is a community study on the bottom and, and a, a bigger study on the top. Well, this, this looks at aortic valve disease in the population and mitral valve disease in the population. And mitral valve is, is this here and here. This is aortic valve. And, and you can see that the incidence of mitral valve disease is, is over twice that of aortic valve disease. Now, in the, in the feasibility trials, there's, there's a number of trials going on. This is just uh, only a couple of the devices that, uh, that are available. We're, we're most familiar with, with this valve here, the Intrepid valve. And I'll, I'll show a case that shows some of the highlights of, of utilizing that prosthesis. But you can see that there's a docking system here because the, the mitral valve, the mitral annulus, changes shape. Uh, between systole and diastole, 
Generally, there, there may be no calcium to hold it in place. It's a dynamic structure being between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So it, it, it causes uh, additional challenges for fixation of the valve in that position. And so that's, uh, that's the design. The engineers have been very ingenious in, in their uh, designs of these valves. The case that I'm going to present is, is actually a double valve case where we use a sapien valve in the, uh, the aortic position and we use a uh, lotus valve in the mitral position. And the, the lotus valve in the mitral position is, is off-label, or was, but uh, um, the case, the case is, it's a 75-year-old lady. She's very symptomatic. She's, she has a, a peak gradient of uh, 40 across her aortic valve. She has severe mitral MAC with a gradient of 16, a porcelain aorta, a prior left subclavian stent, bad lungs, and clearly, clearly not a surgical candidate, uh, if, if not just because of the porcelain aorta alone. But uh, physiologically, she's, she's a, a very challenging patient. So this, this is the uh, transthoracic Thank echo, and uh, it shows the uh, aortic stenosis, the, the mitral, mitral MAC, and, and uh, you can see the gradient uh, of these are, are both very high peak gradient of around in the 60s, and uh, for the aortic valve and for the mitral, it's about 13, 14. And what we did first was we did the, the aortic valve, and this shows using a sapien valve in the aortic position. This is the sapien valve here, and uh, this is an aortogram. And, of course, we have Randy or Manny here helping us on some of these cases, and, and they, they're giving us our, uh, their advice. Um, and, and the thing with Randy is, in, in surgery, he's not as pessimistic as as, uh, <laughs> as Vivek uh, indicates he is in the cath lab. So he, he seems to be happier in the OR. <laughs> and this this shows the uh, uh, measurement of the aortic mitral angle, which is which is important in, in to know this in any of the mitral transcatheter valves that we implant because. Like, like in the, the older valves and in, in the early surgical days of mitral valve replacement, the valve heights were high, they were occlusive, and they could, uh, once you've implanted them in a mitral position, you, can, you could occlude the LVL flow tract. So the transition, at least in the surgical world, has been lower profile valves, at least as far as the, the tissue valves, lower profile valves, and we've moved part of the valve into the left atrium so that there's less in the left ventricle so it doesn't impinge upon the LV outflow tract. Now this shows the TEE of, of the, the mitral valve showing a mitral stenosis because of the mitral MAC. And you know, here we can see the, the again, when, when we see the gradient here, so more, more information for us. And these are some, some pretty pictures that, that Manny got together, and uh, we can see the 3D images here. And again, it, it tells us that we have a problem that uh, we're planning on fixing. And, and here we can see that uh, uh, color flow Doppler, we can see there's uh, good flow through the LVI flow tract and mitral stenosis. So here we are, our, our approach to the mitral valve is, again, we're using a, a lotus valve, and the approach is transapical. The, the LV apex is out here, and this is done through a mini left anterior thoracotomy that we've, we've localized fluoroscopically where to make the incision, and the incision's about two to three centimeters in length. And we've, we've crossed the mitral valve, you can see the back here, this calcium here beneath this aortic valve. 
uh, Safari wire uh, there, and then the, the prosthesis is, is across the valve. And here we're deploying the valve. This uh, Lotus valve typically is, is, a, is a, an aortic valve. It's a Taber valve. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very good valve. We like it because it really seals the annulus. We, our paravalvular leak rates are very low with the, with the Lotus valve. And this is sort of our attempt to use it in the mitral position. And, and here, this is post-deployment. Post, uh, and it looks pretty good. We don't see uh, uh, much paravalvular leak at all. So we, we think that was a good success. And this is 2D echo, and there, there may be a little wisp you could kind of see out here, but it's, it's, it's very trivial. And this is an LV gram, so we see, we see no paravalvular leak, left atrium over here, and uh, the two valves in place. So, you know, you might ask, well, are we, are we obstructing the LV outflow tract? You know, so this is, this is looking at gradients, and, and you know, I think the, the message here is that the, the LV outflow tract looks, looks smaller. Our angle was measured at... Uh, 119 degrees. Uh, generally, we like that to be over 120, 130 is better. But in the end, there's uh, there's there's no significant gradient across the LV outflow tract, even though it looks more like a crescent moon than than a circular opening. Uh, the second case is is a 60 year old gentleman, 61 year old gentleman. He's had prior coronary bypass grafting. He's had multiple PCIs, chronic hepatitis C, uh, again vetted by two surgeons and felt to be a, uh, a poor surgical candidate. So we, we said, well, let's, let's look at some other ways to take care of this patient. And you know, here we see uh, severe mitral regurgitation. Again, here's a, a 3D view. So, you know, we, we say, well, what's, what's, you know, what can we do? We, we don't really feel that we have adequate calcium. We don't have any prior surgical devices in the mitral position. So we, we felt that a, a valve that was designed for the mitral valve would be the best choice for this patient. And here's a good view. It shows the, uh, of the LV outflow tract and the mitral regurgitation. So the valve that was chosen for this patient is, is the, uh, the Intrepid valve, which is uh, the Medtronic 12 trial. And this is a radiographic image. This is the actual image. You can see these little barbs on the side, which are help maintain it into position. This outside structure is the, the uh, docking device, and it has a built-in valve inside of this docking device, a, a good pictogram here on the right side. And how do we, how do we deploy this valve? Well, this, this valve is deployed transapically. This, this is, you can see, uh, it looks like a pipe that we're gonna stick in the apex of the heart. It's 40 French. It's, it's much bigger than, than what we use for transapical tavers. Uh, it's a little bit more finicky where you where you place this in the apex, so it's it's kind of it kind of puts us into uh, approaches to the heart, uh, the apex of the heart that are a little different than what we're used to transapically for the taber valves. But the, the the key is that once you get to this place on the uh, anterior wall of the LV, it's more the anterior wall rather than the apex most of the time. And, and generally, it's, it's between the, the last diagonal branch of the left anterior descending and the left anterior descending itself. 
we put purse strings and we place a guide wire through uh, an access needle in the apex and we, we, we cross the mitral valve. But uh, that's, that's why we do it with the, the, when we use taver valves, but with this we actually pass this under echo guidance. And, you know, again, this is where Randy and Manny come into uh, this procedure. They're very helpful in telling us uh, we, we kind of do it stereotactically using Randy as our, our device. And he'll say, you know, go anterior, go lateral, go medial. And he steers us through the mitral valve. So that's, that's how we get this through the mitral valve. And then we flower the valve and actually pull it back down towards the annulus. And once we're sure that we, we, we'd like where it is, then we, we begin deployment. So this part, the lower part comes out and we deploy the valve and then we remove the, the uh, big trocar there. So it's, it's, uh, it's beautifully engineered. The valve and, and deployment device are both beautifully engineered, but uh, we're learning a lot about it. We have a lot more to learn because it's, it's a much bigger device. So we, we look forward to using this in the future. Now here's, here's uh, this shows the, we've crossed the valve, and this is uh, TEE, interoperative TEE. This shows uh, the valve, you can see the device across the valve here. And again, we, we do spend a lot of time making sure everything's right because we don't want to have to go in there surgically and, and fish this thing out if it's in the wrong place. And here the valve is flowered. You can see the, the edges that will support it in the left atrium. This is left atrium. And you can see this one moving around a little bit as it comes in and out of plane. And we actually bring this down to the annulus and once we're sure it's in position, then we, we deploy the valve. And you know, here, here you can see it coming down. It's, it's closer to the wall of the left atrium. And here it's deployed. You can see the valve leaflets moving. And perhaps a little paravalvular leak over here, but we've, we've had uh, good success with these that they, they seal pretty readily. And some 3D images here. It shows the valve in place. The looks, looks almost like a surgical valve. So this... Uh, um, Shows a, the color flow Doppler. We can see the mitral here, the LVI flow tract here. And again, this is the LVI flow tract before, and here it is afterwards. So it, it does it does sit down sit down in the ventricle, and can uh, can uh, uh, obstruct the LVI flow tract. And here we can see things in the a short axis view where this is sort of uh, more lenticular, this is round, but you know, uh, again, no, no significant gradients in the LV outflow tract. And this, this is things that you can do with uh, the modeling software with this, uh, you know, the 3D, 3D echo. Some nice pictures, surgeons like these pictures. <laughs> That's because you're simple. Simpletons. Simpletons, okay. All right. That's all right, all super. Thank you very much, Jim. That's great.